family is said to be the pillar of human society. What will happen if we change, in a fundamental way, how babies are made? A highly controversial effort is underway to produce children by cloning. If the U.S. would decide to ban this technology, it would not affect us in any way, shape, and form. We have friendlier countries, friendlier territories, friendlier people to be working with us. It's reckless and irresponsible, and it ignores scientific facts. If it works, we're going to ultimately start diverging from the standard natural human being to the genetically enhanced human being. Advancing at breathtaking speed, cloning is not just about babies. This technology may save lives and heal the sick. It's a miracle that, that nature has given us this gift. It may alter our pets, farms, and zoos. It may even bring animals back from the dead. Welcome to the Clone Age. For many, the very idea of cloning conjures images of zombies or monsters. But clones, genetic duplicates, already live among us. You may even know some. Twins who develop from a single egg are, in fact, clones. We always say we're two individuals that make one heck of a whole together. We're tighter than... I think normal sisters are because we feel things weirdly and just. Yep. If we were clone, clone, yes, um, it wouldn't be fun. It would. We all would be the same. Right? Exactly, exactly the same. Person. And if all people were the same, the world would be boring. Yeah. yeah. The announcement in 1997 of a cloned sheep named Dolly took the world by surprise. Among the startled was Boston University health lawyer George Annis. My God, they can clone a mammal. They said they could never do that. And um, virtually that was like scientific dogma that you can't clone a mammal. So I was quite amazed. Uh, that was my first reaction. My second reaction is someone's going to want to do this to a human. What will happen if we do clone people? What brave new world lies ahead? I think uh, you start talking about like what Adolf Hitler did with his Aryan race. Just because you clone something doesn't mean it's going to have the same soul. I feel that it's um, kind of anti-God. There'd be like a higher race of these clone people who are all genetically perfect. You're basically playing with something you don't understand and, and probably creating very deformed uh, beings. Cloning has two completely different goals. Most people think it's about making a copy of an animal or person. That's reproductive cloning. But there's another kind. Therapeutic cloning tries to make spare parts to help the sick. Replacement organs or tissues. One in three Americans will develop a disease that therapeutic cloning might someday treat. Arthritis, MS, diabetes, Parkinson's, and perhaps most important for actor Christopher Reeve, spinal injury. Best known for his role as Superman, Reeve was paralyzed from the shoulders down in a riding accident. Yeah, I was injured Memorial Day weekend in 1995 by uh, going over a 
fence uh, without my horse in our competition. Yeah, he stayed on one side, I went on the other, and that ended up with a, uh, what's called a hangman's fracture, a uh, broken neck. Reeve, like Superman, is now trying to help people in distress. An advocate for therapeutic cloning, he knows that science must make a big leap if those with spinal injuries are ever to walk again. Reproductive and therapeutic cloning start the same way. You use a cell from a person or animal to create a tiny embryo, a clone of about 100 cells. From here, the two types of cloning take different paths. For people like Reeve, this ball of cells may be their only chance to escape a wheelchair. For others, this tiny embryo is a precious human life. Pastor Russell E. Saltzman is a diabetic who might himself benefit from therapeutic cloning, but this would require creating an embryo, his clone. I'm going to create a replica of myself, a genetic replica of myself, and kill it. Does this make any sense? There's, to me, there's something fundamentally abhorrent in that. I mean, this is science fiction stuff, uh, bad science fiction stuff, monster science fiction stuff. We need to be able to imagine what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes. Just stop and imagine what it would be like. You know, to be sitting in this wheelchair for seven years. Not able to even feed yourself or hug your kids. I don't think it's right for them to say that I can't have a life. That this cluster of cells should be given the opportunity to become a life while I'm already here and I'm living. Andrea Gordon was having the time of her life when a dire illness struck at the age of 28. I was single, I was having fun, spending money, traveling, enjoyed life. I must say I thought I was a very healthy young woman. I was going in for my yearly gynecological exam. So the nurse comes in, she takes my blood pressure and she's like, oh, this stupid thing must be broken. So she comes back into the room with a portable blood pressure cuff, takes it, tells me not to move. She leaves. Five seconds later, the doctor comes running in. I can't imagine what's going on. So he takes my blood pressure and he stands back from me. And he's like, how do you feel right now? And I'm like, well, and look, I have this headache. Your blood pressure's 210 over 109. You're going right to the emergency room. The concern on the doctor's faces kind of let me know, like, this is something big. They're now looking at the tissue sample of my kidney that they took from the biopsy. It was like, whoa, her kidney's dead. Get this girl on dialysis right away. I've never known anyone in kidney failure. And of course, I always thought it was all old people. Dialysis will only keep her alive for a few years. To make it to age 40, she must get a kidney transplant organs become available. It's a sad, unfortunate fact of life, but people still drink and drive. When our hospital's on call for the helicopter, you see it coming overhead, and you're out there with fellow transplant patients thinking, maybe this is it. If she doesn't reach the top of the kidney waiting list in time, her survival may depend on cloning. I take solace in the fact that if I had to come down with this dreaded disease that killed my kidneys, at least it's in this day and age. So Gordon is keeping a hopeful eye on research. Near Blacksburg, Virginia, PPL Therapeutics is working on a solution. They want to clone pigs whose organs can be transplanted into people. The world's first cloned pigs were created here by a team led by geneticist Dave Ayers. There's a real shortage right now of human organs for transplantation. About 80,000 people on waiting lists in the U.S. alone, 16 people dying every day waiting for those organs. And this is an opportunity that we can now genetically modify pigs and use their organs to overcome that shortage of organs. I think using pigs for producing organs for people that are on waiting lists, potentially dying on waiting lists, is a much better use of 50 or 100,000 pigs than putting them on our table. Ayers' challenge is that pig organs can't be put into people until the pigs are modified. 
If I were to transplant a regular pig heart into my chest right now, it would be rejected, turn black and necrotic uh, within a few minutes and stop functioning. And the reason for that is because there's a sugar on the surface of all pig tissues and organs, and that sugar says, I'm a pig. It would be a fatal reaction in that person. That, that organ wouldn't survive for more than a few minutes. So our goal is to knock out or delete the gene that's responsible for putting that sugar on the surface of those pig cells so that organ now can be transplanted into humans. But the only way to make a lot of pigs without the I'm a pig gene is through cloning. Cloning starts with an egg cell. Inside are genes that instruct the cell to turn into, say, a pig, just as a sheet of music tells you how to play a song. To create a clone, you vacuum out the genes to get rid of the existing instructions. Then you put in a new set of instructions, a new set of genes from an adult animal you want to copy. But that's not all. You also have to tweak the new instructions. Just like rewriting a piece of music, you have to change the notes, erase some, rearrange others. You now have a new set of instructions that will tell the clone how to grow. With pigs, a surgeon implants about 150 single-cell embryos, embryos please. each genetically modified into a sow. What's the number on it? Perhaps five piglets will come to term, but before Andrea Gordon can get the organ she needs, many scientific puzzles must be solved. The science of cloning isn't exactly new. In the late 1800s, a sea urchin embryo in ocean water was shaken, not stirred. The embryo split into separate cells, and each grew into an identical animal, a clone. And so the prickly problem of reproductive cloning was solved for the first time. Could other animals be cloned? In 1902, Hans Spiemann investigated salamanders. Unlike a sea urchin embryo, a salamander embryo can't be shaken apart. In a moment of inspiration, Spiemann took a hair from his baby son and used it to create a loop. He lassoed the embryo. As he tightened the noose, the two-cell embryo divided neatly into separate cells. Each cell developed into an adult salamander, two clones, twins. In the 1960s, cells from a juvenile frog, a tadpole, were used to clone an adult. But only with Dolly did scientists at last show that a clone could be made from an adult mammal. Dolly wasn't created in a day. It took 277 tries to make her, 276 embryos that never survived to term. Even today, typically only a few percent of clone embryos develop to birth, and the health of those that do is being questioned. Dolly, for example, suffers from arthritis and may have other signs of premature aging. No one yet knows how common defects are in clones. Young clones can have trouble breathing. In some species, animals die young or grow too large. Given the uncertainty about animal clones' health, is now the time to try cloning people. Rudolf Janisch is a cloning pioneer at MIT's Whitehead Institute. Should we use humans as guinea pigs? I disagree with um, those cloning activists who believe that because Dolly was born and became an adult, this is now a technique which we could use for humans. But in Lexington, Kentucky, one reproductive specialist says the time for human cloning has come. Panos Zavos has been working with infertile couples since 1978. We can clone a human embryo as early as tomorrow. But to clone a human embryo for reproductive purposes, that means that you need to take that embryo 
and make sure that it is absolutely, positively, definitely perfect. I think this is just nonsense. You can't do this. Even if they appear physically normal, I would argue they may not, and you might only see this in 10, 15, 20 years, that there are problems which we cannot predict ever. There's almost a four percentage uh, incidence of abnormalities when you do it normally under natural conditions in your own bedroom. Therefore, those are imperfections that everybody lives with, and we're prepared to live with our imperfections as well. One woman who's prepared to take her chances is Vivian Maxwell. 40 years old and single, she has tried without luck to have a child by artificial insemination. This means a lot to me, having my own child, and I will do anything to get it. Been through numerous surgeries, tried every effort, every clinic, every seminar you could think of. Today, Maxwell visits her nieces and her sister near Sacramento, California. I show them a good time because I don't have children of my own. They're like my own surrogate children. Maxwell's family ties are strong. For her, a genetic link to a child is essential. I can adopt and love a child. I can have donor eggs and have a child. I would love that child, but there's, it's not the same. I can't sit that child down and explain things from my mother's history or my father's history. Technically, it doesn't pertain to that child because genetically it is not mine. Who is this? If she wants a related child, she has few options. Her sisters are too old to donate eggs, so cloning has begun to intrigue her. In my spare time, I like to surf the internet, and I was looking into cloning as a possible hopeful option before my time is up. I wish there was a clinic local in Sacramento doing it because I would be the first one in line. Given the speedy development of cloning technology, Maxwell's chance may come soon. But for now, she waits and hopes. There's no guarantee that if you were to clone Albert Einstein, he wouldn't want to be a basketball star in his environment. And the same, Michael Jordan might want to be a great medical researcher and try to kill viruses. It's not the same person. It's not. I'd have to like hang out with that clone yeah, yeah. and see what they're all about. Yeah. In principle, a single healthy cell is all it takes to clone a person. That's why one company wants to offer DNA copyright to celebrities in case their genes are stolen. A cloned child could be made of anyone. Tiger Woods, Tom Cruise, Sean Connery, from skin cells left on a drinking glass. Or a used strand of floss. But in what sense would a clone be the same? In fact, clones aren't even physically identical. These calves are all clones with essentially identical genes, but their markings vary slightly. That's because they developed under different conditions in the womb. Only one of these calves has a black ring around his eye. The other differences among them are, well, subtle. Clones can also act differently. Just ask human clones, so-called identical twins. Well, well, you can say we're, we're to, a, to a point where we're identical, but then to a point we're not. Well, yeah. Yeah, she, uh, I have bigger gap between my teeth. Monica has the longest hair. She has the longest hair. Each of us has different... Uh, I have different I mean, I'm a little bit taller than... She's a little bit taller. I mean, I look at her and I say, oh, I don't look like that. We don't look like that. They figure you, you act the same, you move the same. And that's why I don't like cloning, because with the cloning, you might create an evil twin. <laughs> she likes to stay up late at night. Yes. I like to get up early in the morning. So there's, there's that difference. Yes. And there's a few other things, like, you know, about guys. <laughs> I don't think Sean Connery's wouldn't be bad, though. No, two Tom Cruises. Tom Cruise, see? We don't have the same taste in men. She likes boys, I like men. Yeah, right. So clones wouldn't look or act exactly alike. Still, cloning may lead to some weird family dynamics. Let's imagine a family of the not-too-distant future when cloning might be an option. In this modern Clone Age family, the husband has cloned himself to produce a son, a chip off the old block. Hi, guys. Hi. The wife has cloned herself to make a daughter. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In fact, 
the apple doesn't fall at all. This is an odd family. The daughter has no genetic relationship to the man she calls dad. The son isn't related to his mom. And here's a twist. The son is the spitting image of the husband at the age his wife first started to date him. The daughter looks just like mom when she married dad. Let's hope the family of the future has health insurance that covers psychotherapy. This family has a third child. They decided to raise a clone of Beethoven to bring a little music into their home. But the lad is having a tough time. Parental expectations can overwhelm the most prodigious of genetic gifts. Mixing genes is not this family's thing. How'd you do on your exam today? I think I did really well, actually. I might have even gotten an A. Good job. And that applies to their pets as well. Also clones. But with a little genetic manipulation, just for fun. For some, Cloning is not merely a recipe for a dysfunctional family. It's a technology that could shake the foundations of civilization. One of the more disturbing things that cloning does is actually change the definition of what it means to be human. The genetics would be from one person, either from a male or a female. It would no longer mean the product of a male and a female. Our whole nature, our whole family relationships, our whole being is wound up in sexual reproduction. And to take that away from being humans, I don't think we have a clue yet to what, uh, to what the implications are for the individual, for the family, and for society. Some argue that a cloned child may be treated like an object. We've never been able to say, we want one exactly like this until now. With cloning, you can actually get one genetically exactly like that. Cloning really does, by definition, treat a child like a product. What is in the best interest of the child? That's the only question that matters. Not my desires, not yours, not the parents, but the best interest of the child. Is it in the child's best interest to be a clone? On the surface, that sounds ridiculous. After the first baby, the, the, the reproductive cloning baby is born, and we dress it either in light blue or a hot pink, as my daughter says. They will love it to death, just like everything else. Whether to make babies by cloning is a big question, but critics point to more unsettling issues. If we can replicate, the temptation to improve may become irresistible. Cloning leads to genetic engineering. It leads to trying to modify the human species or modify the individual one at a time. Once we start tweaking genes, it's hard to predict where we'll end up. We can go as far as assisting somebody to have a biological child of their own, but the minute that they begin to change eye color and height and features of that nature and try to create a, a superior child, I think that's dangerous. It's going to be so different from us, the naturals, if you will, that it's going to create this tension that we've seen throughout human history, where, where one group sees even people of the same species now as the other. And that's going to ultimately lead to enslavement, or I think even the potential is there for genocide, for one group to be so threatened by the other group that they ultimately destroy it. If reproductive cloning has a dark side, Therapeutic cloning may be the only ray of hope for patients like Andrea Gordon. Her prospects were brighter right after her diagnosis with kidney failure. At the time, she met with loved ones. She asked if any would consider donating a kidney to save her life. An aunt by marriage turned out to be a tissue match. She sat down with her Bible. She said she thought God told her to do it. And she said and immediately a calm just came over her, just washed it over her. And then from that point forward, she said she had no second thoughts. She and her aunt endured hours of risky surgery. 
my mother was right by my bedside when I first woke up, and um, she took off the oxygen mask, and I asked how Auntie Donna was. And she said, fine. And I, I said, the kidneys work? And she goes, yeah. She goes, it started working before they even finished hooking it up. I felt better. I knew. Losing one of her organs to give it to me so I could live blew me away. Absolutely blew me away. She was lucky, but the drug she now had to take to keep her body from rejecting the new kidney had terrible side effects. People constantly bring attention to my situation. Why are you shaking so much? You know, grabbing my hands. Oh, I saw you six months ago. Why is your face so fat? Um, I'm on steroids. Still, she felt as if she were getting her life back. But then came a reversal of fortune. Two years and eight months later, I um, woke up in the middle of the night with this god-awful earache. So in order to treat the ear infection, they had to take me off the anti-rejection drugs to raise my immune system to fight the ear infection. And then consequently, I lost the kidney. My body fought the kidney right out of me. I have no options now for a living donor. I have no siblings to come forward. Um, my parents are both ineligible. As she waits for a kidney from a cadaver or from a medical breakthrough, her life revolves around a single thing. It's dialysis. Five times a day, seven days a week. Every four hours, starting at five o'clock in the morning. That's my life. How long will she have to wait before she is freed of her fragile lifeline, one that could fail her at any moment? Some are trying to clone animals for organ transplants, and the patient's desperate to receive them. But a California company is using similar technology to make nearly identical animals for food. Building a better chicken is the dream of geneticist Rob Etches. A hundred years ago, if you wanted to produce a superb chicken, you would take a very good male and a very good female, cross them, and get offspring that had the attributes you were after. So what we're offering the poultry industry today is the opportunity to look at a particular individual and say, that is a great bird. We're going to make a lot of copies of that individual. In experiments at Origin Therapeutics, black feathered chickens represent the great bird, a meaty bird that grows fast and efficiently. But here's the big problem. You can't raise enough meaty birds to make money. They don't lay enough eggs. So, how do you get a lot of meaty birds? You hijack the eggs of a good layer like this white chicken. The experiment starts with a fertilized egg from the good layer. Each egg has a tiny embryo that would develop into another good layer. But instead, the embryo gets an injection of cells from meaty bird embryos. Arjun calls this metacloning. The meaty bird cells mix with the good layer cells to form what's called a chimera, one animal composed of two different cell lines. The chicks emerge color-coded. Black patches have developed from meaty bird cells. The blacker the chick, the meatier the adult. People have been breeding chickens for a very long time. And I see ourselves as simply breeding chickens using some new tools. You have some affinity with the species you work with, and uh, you certainly see them as very interesting chickens. And the ones that uh, we're developing here are exceedingly interesting chickens. This adult chimera is a success. Most of its feathers are black, which means most of its body developed from meaty chicken cells. After meaty fowl can reliably be made from ordinary eggs in the lab, this process will be scaled up to factory production by another company. Fertile eggs from good layers will be injected with meaty bird cells.
When it comes to animals, cloning technologies can lead to mass production or to the creation of a single special creature. The first cat clone was born in 2001 to much fanfare. But with 120 million dogs and cats in the U.S., do we really want to clone them? You're not going to get your dog or your cat back. It's not a way to make your cat immortal. You're going to get a genetic duplicate, but the cat won't know you. Uh, it won't have its old habits. Uh, you'll have to rebond with it, and if it doesn't do what your former pet did, you're likely not to be very happy with it. Some pet owners know that a clone won't be identical, but still they find the idea intriguing. Allison Larcombe and her family got this puppy after their beloved dog Parkway passed away. But it's not the same. Why should Parkway be cloned? Only because of, well, his place in our lives and his place in our hearts. Um. <laughs> hey, Allie, come on, how about lunch? Okay. We recognize that it will not be Parkway. It would be a very, very interesting opportunity to have basically a, his twin, his twin brother, perhaps, with us. Parkway. He was a stray who had been hit by a car on the Garden State Parkway. He made it to the side of the road. I had scooped him up, brought him to a local veterinarian. And I remember when they asked me, what is the dog's name? I said, he's a stray. Well, come on, he must have a name. And I said, well, let's call him Parkway. And the name stuck. He was protective of Allison. She'd be in the stroller. If a visitor came over and approached the stroller, he always made a point of standing between the stroller and the visitor. There's Parkway and Allie. We have 15 candles on this cake. Again, Allison, someday you'll see how weird your parents really were, but this is our wow. favorite pupster. And yes, we do celebrate his birthday. Parkway was a very sweet dog. He had a very, very kind disposition. And we miss him very, very much. Good job, almost. I did take the steps to preserve his DNA. I spoke to my wife about doing this, and I think she thought I'd bumped my head. <laughs> and she said, go ahead if you want to. My daughter has always known Parkway to be around, and I think I would like the opportunity to have a dog very, very close to him again. Many researchers are trying to clone pets, but a few want to resurrect extinct animals. Jurassic Park has evolved from science fiction to merely a scientific long shot. Australian researchers are trying to bring back the Tasmanian tiger, which vanished in the 1930s. And what might cloning offer species alive today that teeter on the brink of extinction? At the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans, researchers are seeking high-tech ways to bring back populations of rare animals. Today, a colobus monkey will be tranquilized for a medical exam. It's the least stressful way for the animal to get good care. Okay. He got it right quad. The woozy monkey gets a dental checkup, blood tests, a complete physical exam. But perhaps the most important procedure is the taking of a tiny plug of skin. Because the black and white colobus is threatened, these cells will be preserved for future cloning efforts. Four of the monkeys live at the Audubon Zoo. Their numbers in Africa are in jeopardy because people are destroying their habitat and hunting them for their pelts. Reproductive physiologist Betsy Dresser admires this striking monkey. I just like it as a species because 
not only is it beautiful, but it's, it's a very graceful species of, of monkey. And um, it's just one that is, is, is really fun to watch. I feel like I'm in the emergency room of the wildlife business sometimes because we can't do this quick enough. Dresser takes the fresh colobus skin cells to a frozen zoo run by the Audubon Nature Institute. These vessels already contain samples from hundreds of species. Gorillas, tigers, turtles are filling up a compact Noah's Ark. Today, another passenger, the colobus, comes aboard. I guess that's what I see in the future, where there's, there's a real base of knowledge and a real caring about trying to save the wildlife that we have today. Because if we don't, we're going to have such an empty planet of just us. It's too early to say if cloning will help save the world's two or three thousand endangered animal species. But Dresser and Philip Damiani, another reproductive physiologist, are already trying to clone rare animals from these cells. Earlier work by Damiani at a different facility gives them reason to hope it's really possible. In 1999, Damiani and colleagues set out to clone a gaur, an ox-like animal from Asia. Gowers are threatened with extinction. They are too rare to donate egg cells or carry experimental babies. So a team at Advanced Cell Technology in Massachusetts takes a cow egg and replaces the cow's genes with those from a gower. The resulting gower embryo will be implanted in a cow. This is the first time that a mother of one species will carry a baby clone of another. Nine months later, a single gower embryo has come to term. This cow is ready to give birth. The whole world was kind of watching what we were doing, so I was pretty nervous. What happens if this animal doesn't make it? This could be a severe blow to the potential use of cloning technology and conservation. I'm, I'm not getting it out this way. A vet confirms that a C-section is the safest method of birth. In a gush of amniotic fluid, an amazing animal enters the world. It's coming. This is the first clone of a species vulnerable to extinction. Noah is soon standing and nursing. But two days later, Noah becomes ill. A bacterial infection apparently unrelated to cloning rages through his body. In his third day, Noah dies. Even if Noah had lived, debate would still swirl over the role of cloning in conservation. The reason they're endangered is mostly because their habitat has been destroyed. And if we get the idea that we can always bring back the endangered species so we can destroy more habitat, I mean, that could actually have a, a worse impact. If we lose species today and we don't have that genetic material, they're gone. They're absolutely gone. If cloning rare species raises tough questions, debate is even hotter when it comes to helping a species with over six billion individuals. We are that species. If therapeutic cloning succeeds in creating spare parts for failing bodies, many human diseases may become curable. But for some, these medical miracles would come at too high a price. Recloning people for human parts, I mean, that's almost like we're butchering people like for cattle and using them to help ourselves out. They are able to grow extra parts for people that may not be replaceable. 
Yeah, I'd go go for it. Why not? We got the technology to do it, so we may as well do it. I'm really not for cloning, but I am sort of for medical research. Back at PPL Therapeutics, the organ transplant research program is making progress. The sow, pregnant with piglet clones, is about to give birth. The clones are born healthy and are one step closer to having transplant organs our bodies won't reject. That's cheering news for patients like Andrea Gordon, whose need for a new kidney is growing more desperate. I'm 34 years old. I'd like to move on with my life. I'd like to have the American dream of getting married, having a child. I can't right now. Everything's on hold. Cloning offers a second kind of hope to Gordon. It may be possible to create a kidney from her very own skin cells, a perfect match that would never be rejected. A test of this remarkable prospect is taking place at Advanced Cell Technology. Just under the cow's skin are miniature kidneys implanted three months ago. The kidney cells come from an embryo, a clone of this cow. Never before have replacement organs created by cloning been tested in an animal's body. Today, the kidney structures will be removed and examined. Are there any signs of rejection? Are the kidney cells working? producing urine. One of the scientists on the project is tissue engineer Anthony Atala of Children's Hospital in Boston. We were pleasantly surprised to see that these structures, when implanted into the cow, were able to make urine, and furthermore, they were not rejected. The implant, thin tubes of kidney cells in a collecting bag, worked. And so Andrea Gordon may be closer to getting the replacement kidney she needs to survive. A doctor might someday create an embryo with Gordon's genes and grow it to a ball of about 100 cells. Inside are embryonic stem cells, cells almost magical in their ability to morph into any tissue of the body. They can be turned into nerve cells, beating heart cells, and someday, Andrea Gordon hopes, into kidney cells. I don't think there's any question that this represents a medical revolution. I think within our lifetime, you will see, for instance, if you got in an accident and, for instance, lost your kidney, that we will, in the future, in our lifetime, you will be able to get a skin cell and we will be able to literally grow you up a new kidney. Medical scientist Robert Lanza is in the front ranks of this revolution at Advanced Cell Technology. He aims to repair not only failing kidneys, but injured spines. At the Reeve Irvine Research Center in California, other scientists treat a rat that's lost the use of its real legs because of nerve damage. As of January of 2002, Dr. Oswald Stewart and his associates were able to take embryonic stem cells and put them into a rat with an acute spinal cord injury, and the rats recovered. When you say recovered? Recovered. They're walking? Recovered. Preliminary results suggest that rats can make a remarkable comeback from paralysis after embryonic stem cell treatment. If someone said, we're going to find these, these cells uh, in embryos that could repair your central nervous system, I wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it, and three years later that happened. You know, so that, it, it is a miracle, you know, this discovery. It's a miracle that, that nature has given us this gift. The same gift may help people with arthritis, diabetes, MS, and even AIDS. Millions of Americans suffer from diseases like these, diseases that involve a faulty immune system. What if therapeutic cloning could fully restore not just organs, but a defective immune system? That's the goal of an ambitious experiment that begins in Pennsylvania. This cow is about 12 years old, no spring chicken. Researchers will try to replace her aging immune system with a peppy, rejuvenated system. 
skin cells from the old cow are shipped to advanced cell technology in Massachusetts. The old cow is cloned and the resulting embryo is rushed back to Pennsylvania. The embryo is implanted in a surrogate mother, then removed and flown by charter plane to New York. The tissues are rushed to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. While the pilot stands by, immune system cells are extracted from the clone. Back in Pennsylvania, these cells are transfused into the old cow. A perfect genetic match from a clone, these cells shouldn't be rejected. The transfused cells travel through blood vessels. They should find their way into the old cow's bones. There, the immune cells should settle into the marrow, the core of the immune system. If it works, the marrow will soon start cranking out new white blood cells, the workhorses of the immune system. The Pennsylvania team takes regular blood samples from the old cow, which are shipped to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Here, the blood is analyzed. Are there fresh white blood cells? Peter Wettstein, an expert on the immune system, is about to see the results for the first time. He wants to know if the old cow's white blood cells are on the rise. The figures look good, but have the new white blood cells really come from the transfused cells? 10 days later, good news arrives at Advanced Cell Technology. We just got some new information that suggests that the new immune cells that we place into the old cows have definitely taken up home and appear to be producing white blood cells. And this data is preliminary, but it looks very encouraging. If the results hold up, it's an amazing first. This old cow's immune system has been rejuvenated. New white blood cells seem to be streaming out of the bone marrow. Such cells might not only halt immune diseases, but more remarkably, help make major repairs, like fixing heart muscle after a coronary. The brain could be healed following a stroke. Wear and tear on old joints might be undone. The hope would be someday we would be able to give an injection that would not only give a patient back a new immune system, but that would also go in and fix any worn out tissue tissues that that patient may have, such as arthritis, or if they had had a stroke or a heart attack, that hopefully these cells would actually go in and repair that worn out tissue. The idea that we're going to be able to provide this kind of therapy for individuals in the United States is a fanciful. Uh, this will be available to the wealthy uh, and people who are willing to sell their homes, basically, to, get, uh, to extend their lives. Many ethicists and religious leaders raise tough questions about therapeutic cloning, and not just about the economics of it. I have had parishioners with diabetes, adult onset, who have suffered amputations. I have concluded for my own life, given a choice between amputation and saving my life by the death of somebody else, you can just call me Gimpy. Friendly neighborhood pastor. This is the living, living off the dead. I hate to say it so bluntly, but that's exactly what it is. We're scavenging those we kill for our own benefit. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Saltzman's concern is this. Therapeutic cloning would involve the destruction of a tiny embryo when embryonic stem cells are taken. The whole question comes down to whether or not a completely microscopic ball of cells that's smaller than the head of a pin warrants the same rights and respect as an adult or a child who may die because we fail to develop this therapy. Almighty God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, order our days and our deeds in his peace. Amen. Scientists point out that the embryo from which stem cells would be taken has no nerve cells and so can't experience pain. 
It doesn't have the potential to develop into a human being unless it is implanted in a uterus. And it's not created the same way that babies are. We're not talking about the union of a sperm and an egg. We're talking about just combining a skin cell with an egg that has had all its genetic material removed. And you're really dealing with only a very small cell mass. Every cell in the body has the potential to become an embryo. Does that mean that every time that we wash our hands and we are shedding thousands of cells, we are killing life? It doesn't. I have no qualms and no moral objections to a cluster of cells you know, one taken from me and then developed in a petri dish and then further developed to produce an organ that will allow me to live free of drugs and will allow me to have a full life. Still, many focus on the embryo from which stem cell therapies would be developed. You stick the word human in front of the word embryo and suddenly you have a potential Bach or a Frank Lloyd Wright or um, an Einstein, a you, a me. It's the word human that defines the thing we're talking about. How soon will a cloned baby be among us? Cloned human embryos were first announced in 2001. They failed to grow bigger than six cells, too small to serve their purpose, therapy research. But rumors have circulated that a woman is pregnant with a clone. And science speeds ahead, driven, some say, by popular demand. People want it. Today they're asking for a new mode of reproductive um, assistance. And people that don't have any testes, people that don't have any ovaries, they can go to a different level. We are obviously making every preparation to clone embryos for reproductive purposes. We're not going to step on dead bodies or deformed babies to get there. Banning it is just not going to make it go away. It's just like sweeping an elephant under the rug. You can try. It's just not possible. The ability to take a single cell from an animal and replicate that animal once seemed the stuff of science fiction. But it's now the stuff of ambitious research, fiery controversy, and wide-eyed human hope. My heart is pounding because there's just the sheer thought of it. That's, <laughs> you know, because I, I do feel as though it's so close. We have entered the clone age. Cloning is already altering our foods. It allows profound tinkering with nature and with human nature. It tempts us to change the course of human evolution. How will we react when clones live among us?